fear and trembling that you step up in the presence like that. So caught up in his presence. Father, we just thank you that when your presence is here like this, then all things are possible. And Father, even now, move among your people, both here and those that are, that are joined by the Internet. Be healed. Be set free. We bind every tormenting spirit that would come against you. Every depressing spirit that would come against you. We bind you now in the name of Jesus and cast you out. You cannot stay in the presence of the Lord. You leave now in Jesus' name. Father, I speak healing of emotions. I see people letting go of old bitterness, old things. Been trying for years to let it go. Tonight, let it go. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Glory. Well, you can be seated if you can. <laughs> it's been one of those days when it's been so difficult for me to uh, settle on what he wants to do tonight. Um, <clears throat> I think I have started a dozen messages and none of them are the message. <laughs> I'm going to say it like this. I have to have more of God or I'm going to die. I'm just, I have to have more. I, I hope you're in that same boat with me. Amen. Are we in fellowship? I can't, I can't take where we are. Let me say where I am, I can't stay here. And somehow I know we're at the end of a season. I don't mean fasting season, but I'm happy about that. I don't, but we're at the end of some kind of a season, and we're coming into a new season. It's going to be scary and wonderful, frightening and blessed. Most of all, it's going to be Him. I have no idea if this message will go out tonight. We'll see. As you do the message that was laid out for us by our, our Pastor Dave Roberson, and you learn to assimilate the word and pray a lot in other tongues to activate the teaching gift of the Holy Spirit, you spend time in worship, do some discipline of the flesh through fasting. It's amazing because you seem to, uh, I'll talk about me mostly, I hope, it's, I hope you can relate, but I'll have seasons where he's having me look really deep into that mirror of 2 Corinthians 3.18. You don't have to turn there, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, we are changed into that same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. James talks about it, the same mirror in James chapter 1. He says, if you continue looking into that perfect law of liberty, not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer, a doer of the work. We talked about that recently. When I look in that mirror, which I know is what the Father has done for us, by grace. He's put, when we were born again, he literally birthed a new man, a new creature on the inside of us. Ephesians 4 tells you that, that that new man is after God in God's image created, and I like to think, not think, I like to say from the get-go in righteousness and true holiness. See, and when I look in that mirror, I know there's a transforming process. You could add a lot of other scriptures as he is. 
so am I in this world. Isn't that right? But see, we're also baptized in the fire of the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist said, I baptize you in water, but he that's coming after me. He's not, I almost kind of wish he had just said, I'm going to, ba he'll baptize you in the Holy, Holy Ghost. But he didn't stop there, did he? When he's going to baptize you in the Holy Ghost and with. So I'll spend time looking in the mirror. Yes. You know, we could go to the in him confessions, everything that we are in him. Yes. I am the righteousness of God. Yes, I am this. I am his son. Yes. Then you spend time praying in the Holy Ghost. and He starts digging around the dirty attic of your soul. He starts going into rooms that you boarded up decades ago. You don't allow anybody to go in there. You don't even go in there yourself. But see that song that they sing, he will not relent until he has us all. He, he, all of us. He's not going to leave any of those doors nailed shut. So I, on the one hand, I'll be, I'll, I'll be doing the message and I get a good look into that mirror. And glory to God, I'm his son. He loves me. I'm righteous. I'm holy. And then spend time praying in tongues and the Holy Spirit takes me by the hand and leads me into one of those. <laughs> I'm not, oh, good. I'm not the only one. Thank God. <laughs> takes me into one of those rooms. And like Dave says, Look at all the dirt this light brought. You know? And I see parts of me that are so unlike Christ. It's, so in the one minute, I'm, yes, I'm his son, I'm righteous, I'm holy. The next, I'm a slime, I'm a worm, I'm a dog. You know? No. He is purging us. He is relentless. That song is really good. He will not relent. He is determined to, you know that old that old uh, question that in the early days I didn't know the answer to. You know, a lot of people still ask it. So why didn't God just for, forgive Adam when Adam sinned? Just forgive him. Why all of this two thousand years and Christ and the law and crucified? Why? Couldn't you just forgive Adam? Well, he did. Really, he did. When he slew that animal and covered Adam and Eve with the bloody skin, something innocent had to die. There's your first type of Christ right there. Or the cross, anyway. That innocent lamb. I'm sure it was a lamb. I can't. That's forgiveness, isn't it? When he covered them, something innocent died in their place. But see, here's why that wasn't enough. Mankind doesn't realize the depth of the fall. What happened to us? There was a season years ago where he had me teaching. Like from God's point of view. We didn't even look like him anymore. We became twisted, depraved creatures with four eyeballs and tentacles coming out our forehead. I'm exaggerating, you know. Maybe green in color. Nobody's green, are they? Okay, green. Don't want to offend anybody. You know what I'm saying? He says, I, it's not a matter of, of just forgiving you. I don't want to forgive you and leave you like you are. How you are is not how I made you. I made you in my image. And I will not relent until I have you in my image again. That's what we're going through. He is determined to conform us to the image of his son. That in our spirit, that's already been done. That's You talk about grace. That's already been done. That new creature is created in that image. But working that image like a seed from the inside to where it starts appearing on the limbs outside, that's, that's the process that we're in. So... Go ahead and, I, I get, yes, Second Peter, we'll try a verse. <laughs> if I get singed, we'll go somewhere else. You know what I mean by, <laughs> I'm really trying to follow him. You don't need to hear me. You really don't. You need to hear him. I'm trying to let him lead this thing. So Second Peter, 
And we're going to look at the very last verse because I said, Lord, what, what is, what's the answer? I mean, Lord, this is miserable. One minute I'm your, I, I'm just walking in the joy of, I'm your son, I'm your child, you love me, you, you've saved me, you bless me, hallelujah. But then as I continue to do the message, there seems like there's the flip side of that coin. And I'm, I get a good look at, at the dirt that's still in the attic, the part of me that's not like Christ, and I just want to die. He says, good. <laughs> that's called mortification. See? I said, well, I can't stay like this. I, what's the answer? We're going to look here in 2 Peter. First and Second Peter are two of the just amazing books. Um, he gives really wise counsel all the way through here. He talks about being persecuted for righteousness sake. He also gives strong warnings about not lapsing back to the flesh. He gives warnings real strong about that. And uh, you know gives, gives examples that's pretty easy to understand, you know, if God didn't spare the angels if God did not spare Sodom and Gomorrah, if God did not spare Noah, I mean, the, day, the people of Noah's day, I could go on. He, he said he's not going to spare you either. So it's, 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 I love those two books, but they're scary as all get out. But what's the answer? When you come right to the end of it, what does Peter counsel us to do? And, and God said, this is, this is where I am, and I think maybe this is where we are right now. So 2 Peter chapter 3, let's just look at the last two verses, but especially the last one. You therefore, now that word therefore means based on everything I've said. If we had time, we'd go verse by verse through the whole book, 2 Peter. But you therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Now notice. His final words. His final counsel from this apostle that walked with our Lord. Can I say it this way? My counsel to you. You need to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. But to grow in knowledge, to grow in knowledge, I, I, we, we've been taught well by our pastor. It's praying in tongues is a revelation gift. The best way to get the, the Word of God in you is to assimilate all the books, read them over and over, equip yourself for day and night meditation, and let the, then pray and let the Holy Spirit begin teaching you line upon line, precept upon precept, the Word of God. See, that part is fairly easy for Gary to understand, grow in knowledge, but grow in grace. For years... Um, you know, if you just look up the common definition of grace, it's unmerited favor. Well, it is. I just got to tell you, that's not very helpful in a practical way. So am I, going, am I supposed to grow in unmerited favor? How do you do that? It was unmerited. Should I unmerit it more? <laughs> what? Peter meant something. See? And to him, it was the answer. My final words to you is you need two things. You need to grow in knowledge and you need to grow in grace. So, as I hear verses, <laughs> let's talk about somebody who understood grace a little bit. Paul the Apostle. He started out Saul of Tarsus. Don't, you don't have to turn here. But it's 1 Corinthians 15, verses 9 and 10. I would think Paul might be a man who grew in the grace of God. Would you think? I would think so. So 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10, he says, For I am the least of the apostles, that am not me to be called an apostle. 
Why, Paul? Because I persecuted the church of God. But now notice what he says. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. But now watch this. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. See, that's more than just unmerited favor. He's going, <laughs> I think Paul visited more cities. He got stoned more often. He got beat more than anybody. He, he said, I labored more than they all. But when he really thinks about it, he said, well, it really wasn't me. It was God's grace. I think this man grew in grace. So I've been meditating on him again. And I thought about his Damascus Road experience. And that happened shortly after Stephen was stoned. You know, Stephen was the first martyr. And Paul, it says, was standing there giving his approval. Well, that's because he had been given letters from uh, Jerusalem. He had he had been given authority, and uh, he held. You know, he 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 wasn't going to get his hands dirty with the rocks. He held the coats while those men stoned Stephen to death. Now, here is the thing: you can be turning to. I hear that uh, Philippians three. I've got a lot of places marked. I just don't know where he's going. <laughs> I had. That's one of them I had marked. Talk about a Hi. Saul of Tarsus before his Damascus Road experience. He thought he was pleasing God so much. He was he was keeping the law. He was against this heresy of this Jesus sect. I mean, if anyone ever tried to please God, it was Saul of Tarsus. And he had more zeal than anybody else. I mean, he became famous. Uh, one passage said he was breathing out slaughters. That, isn't that something? He'd bring them back, not only arrest them and bring them back, some of them would be executed. Not... And it wasn't just that. Even before he started doing that, he says in Philippians 3, according to the law, blameless. I mean, he was determined he was going to live for God. Can I say it that way? He was going to keep the law, keep every commandment. If he broke it, he was going to offer the sacrifice. He was going to keep the feast, do the festivals, wear the right thing, say the right thing, do the right thing. And he was already a Hebrew of the Hebrews. I'll read it in a minute thought he was pleasing God. See, he's a little different than the alcoholic or the drunk or the, you know, you can be a lost sinner that way or you can be a lost religious sinner and you're both just as lost. Saul was completely lost, persecuting the church and thought he was pleasing God. That's the amazing thing. He thought he was doing the right thing, even his, all of his energy, all of his life. I will stamp out this Christianity. I will, it's a heresy against the law of Moses. I'm your man, God. Then he has that Damascus Road experience. Can you imagine? Every, when he met Jesus, he only had two things to say. Who are you? Who are you? And I like how he worded it. Who are you, Lord? In other words, I don't know who you are, but whoever you are, you are Lord. <laughs> smart man. Smart man. Then the second, of course, the Lord says, I'm Jesus. I'm the very one that you're persecuting. His second question was just about as good as the first. Lord, what would you have me do? And there it is. Surrender. Okay. 
when I think about my dirty attic, it's completely different, kind. Mine wasn't religious dirt. Well, some of it. Mine was more sin dirt. I don't think Saul had a lot of sin dirt, but it was dirt. He had to let every bit of it go. Even though he has the memory of it, you can tell right there. He has the, I persecuted the church. It's not like he forget it. He has the memory of it. But you know what else he has the memory of? The blood has washed every bit of that away. See? It's grace. Saul, we just read it. He said, Paul, Saul, who became Paul, says, I am what I am by the grace of God. God saved him. If I can find this, I'm hearing this off a page I wrote from a John G. Lake quote again. Did you know John G. Lake's uh, genealogy, he was Scottish? If you check back his genealogy, he's Scottish, and they're pretty stubborn people. He says, what, when he was still a young boy, John G. Lake made the decision that he was going to live a morally pure life. Gary does not have this testimony that I'm about to read. John G. Lake had it. He says, I never touched whiskey. I never touched tobacco. I never committed an un unholy act in the moral sense. I, I, uh, we walk different paths. <laughs> you can be a religious sinner or you can be a sinner sinner. And you're just as lost. So he says that, I never committed an unholy act and that the proud heart of mine had to struggle like a drowning man until I finally said, Lord, you save me. I cannot save myself. Saul of Tarsus came to that under, same understanding on the road to Damascus. It's amazing that he did not get judgment if Jesus was an earthly king and you were caught killing his soldiers like Stephen, you might be brought into judgment and executed yourself. Isn't that right? See, when you come to the throne of grace, what's the first thing you find? That you might obtain mercy and grace to help in your time of need. So the subject tonight is growing in grace. Growing in grace. Um, grow in grace. On this trip that we just got back from um, to Ohio, I, I got a little more insight about what grace is. See, see, I'll be honest with you. I could give a rip about your definition of grace if it doesn't help me walk better. I, I want to walk higher than I've walked before. I want to walk more like him than I have before. I, I could care less if you know the Greek definitions. I, I, I use them myself. It's fine. But can you please tell me how I can grow in grace so I'm not the same person I was last year? Now, see, that's, that's what I'm after. I'm not interested in anything else. Well, he gave me a practical insight on what he means by grace, this unmerited favor that he keeps talking about. And believe it or not, he used my daughter Angie on this trip. And it's not just really this trip. I've, I've known Angie. I've known Angie a long time. <laughs> I've pretty much known her her whole life, you know. Angie, for those that don't know, and, I, and I'm not, I mean, my other daughters are this way, but with Angie, it's just really highly developed. Angie lives to help. If, if, if you are in a situation and Angie is nearby, and you're having trouble with anything. If you allow her, she will help you uh, with anything. You know, and so we take something as simple as maybe somebody's in a wheelchair and they're, they're just trying to, to open the door to go out of the building and there's nobody happens to be there right then. It, you know, if, if, if Angie sees that and she might make eye contact and if they, if they, if they don't like you know, repel her or turn her away, man, she'll run. She'll get over there. She'll open that door for them. 
She will do for them what they can't do for themselves. That's what grace is. He's trying to get me to understand. See, the first level is that man could not stop sinning. He couldn't. Even the ones that wanted to stop, like the guy in Romans 7, with my mind, I, I agree, your law is good and righteous and holy, and I, I set myself that I'm going to keep it, and I'm not going to do those bad things anymore, and I'm, I am going to do those good things, and then what happens? Well, the bad thing I wasn't going to do, I wound up doing that, and the good thing I was going to do, I never did get her done. Oh, woe is me, you know, and who shall deliver me? Thank God to our Lord Jesus Christ. See, God, by grace, put His Spirit in you. And He put it in me. We put a new nature, and it is free. There, this is what I was, with, with Saul of Tarsus, all of his labor, all of his working, all of his striving his whole life to please God by his own effort, he finally had to count every bit of that. The nice word is dung. <laughs> Poop. <laughs> uh, okay, that's good enough. <laughs> Worth nothing. Like, let's read it. You still in Philippians 3? Or did I ever say go there? I didn't go to Philippians 3. I didn't say go there. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So he gives his pedigree here a little bit. I know you've read this before. But we're headed to a really grace verse. This is, this is the one. It's, it's in chapter 4. If you're real nice and give a nice love offering. No, I'm teasing. I'll tell you which verse it is. But, but <laughs> Philippians 3, eight, wait, you have to start in verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. And what's funny, he says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. That means the circumcision. He was them. Saul of Tarsus, he was the head of them. You understand? I mean, not exactly because these guys were saying you could be Christian, but you had to keep the law. He was saying you couldn't even be Christian. Okay? But he was, he was like the epitome of the bad. <laughs> he says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And here he starts listing his pedigree. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. Now he's talking about before he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. If any man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more. Circumcised. Now he's talking all this stuff from the law. Circumcised the eighth day. Of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Now we know nobody perfectly kept the law. If anybody did, Jesus didn't have to die. But what he's saying is, whenever he might, I, mean, I bet he did pretty good, but whenever he missed it, he would offer the appropriate sacrifice, and that would make him blameless. So he was a stickler. He was doing everything he could to please God. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ Paul is the one that wrote Ephesians and Colossians and Philippians and where we get all of the revelations <laughs> he's the one that received the the real understanding of the new birth meaning He's a new creature. He's not a Hebrew anymore. He's not of the tribe of Benjamin or, or anything else. He's of the tribe of Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is his Adam. His righteousness is of God. Oh, and, and, oh, it's, <laughs> oh, anyway. Could preach right there forever. But be found in him, not having mine own righteousness. Well, his whole life was trying to develop his own righteousness before 
Not, try, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is of God by faith. I've got to finish reading part of this. That I may know him. What did Jesus define eternal life to be? Father, that they may know thee and, and Jesus Christ. So that means and to know Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. That is life eternal. Paul is saying the same thing. Not to know about him either. You've got to have your own relationship with him. You've got to know him. That I might know him. And the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. I thank God for this verse. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. Even Paul. He says, I haven't arrived. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus and we're all pressing toward that mark. But now let's talk about growing in grace. Peter says the answer, you need to grow not only in knowledge, you need to grow in grace. If you keep reading this and we, you know, for, let's come on down here a little bit. Chapter 4, let's start in verse 10. It's hard for me to start there, but we will. <laughs> See, this, this letter to the Philippians is really a combination teaching letter and a thank you letter. The Philippians, which is the uh, Macedonian, sometimes he calls them, church at Philippi. You'll find out here in just a little bit if we get that far that this was the only church that financially supported Paul in the beginning of his ministry. They're the only ones. Sidebar. That sure gives you one understanding of what Paul did not preach. Everywhere he went, he did not preach in all those churches, God will bless you if you give into my ministry. Because if he'd have preached that, they would have been given. Sure gets quiet right there every time. Isn't that an, isn't that an insight? But they had found out, they lost track of Got, he got arrested. They lost track of him. Didn't know where he was. Didn't know where to send money. But they found him. He had been arrested. And they sent a guy named Epaphroditus. They took up an offering. They sent Epaphroditus, who nearly lost his life trying to get the money there. And he brought that gift to Paul. And now Paul is sending back with Epaphroditus this letter and a thank you. You know, It's a thank you and a teaching letter. But now notice this. Pick it up in verse 10. We're still talking about growing in grace. He says, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. He's talking about that gift. Wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. In other words, I know you wanted for a long time to give, but you didn't have the opportunity. Basically, they didn't know where he was. Now, notice this. Not that I speak in respect of want. For I have learned. If you underline, please underline learned. Sometimes this takes a while. It is something that is learned. It's not born in you. You learn this. <laughs> in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased. You know what abased means? That's probably where they lock you up and take everything away and you got dry beans and a cup of water every day to drink. I mean, <laughs> abased. And I know how to abound. That's where you have more than enough. He says, I've, I've, I've been in both situations. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Now notice, everywhere and in all things, I am instructed... I like that word, instructed, both to be full 
and to be hungry. Modern Christians today, they would never say that they were instructed to be hungry. Depends on where he sends you. I am instructed. That word instructed is really strong. It, it goes right along with learned. Holy Ghost taught him these things. He taught me how to be full. Taught me how to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer need. Sue and I and Alan and others. Of course in a first world country people laugh at you when you say you've ever suffered need. You know. Our suffering need is probably luxury to most of the world. Okay. But by American standards, we've suffered need. We know what it is not to know where your next meal is coming from, not to have any gas in the car to even go anywhere. And, and uh, you know, we know what that part is. We don't know a whole lot about abounding. We know a little bit, not, not like he. And Solomon knew something about abounding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, but anyway, that's not the message tonight. But I, did you notice the, the link between learned and instructed? Holy Ghost had to teach him. He's like anybody else. Gary, I'll just tell you, I'll use Gary and not you. Gary likes it when we abound. I'm not so crazy about the suffering need. And, uh, you know. But the Holy Ghost is teaching me, like he's teaching the rest of us, to be content no matter where we are. And how do you do that, though? See, we're not through yet. Verse 12 again. No, look at verse 11. I want, to hear, I want to hit that word learned again. Not that I speak in respect of want. In other words, I'm not in, I'm not, I'm not in lack. For I have learned. Again, I have learned. I want to say it another way. I sat in the classroom and was taught until I learned. Now, the classroom might have been experience. But I'll tell you right now, the teacher was the Holy Ghost. You hear me? I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Someday I will have that same testimony. I'm more content than I used to be. Okay? But I doubt I'm that con content. But I will be if I keep allowing the instructor to learn me. Bad grammar to teach me. I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. But now here is the key. I told you earlier, the, the key to growing in grace. It's right here. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Angie, come here for a minute. Sorry, baby. I'm going to pretend. If, can you all pretend that I have no arms? And I, I'm trying to think of examples that won't offend anybody. If you have no arms, I, I, I'm not picking on you. I could pick other things. I'm just trying to illustrate a point. I have a, in my case, I have no arms. Can you see that? For videos, purposes, I'm doing my best. I have no arms. But there's a folder on the floor in front of me, and I need it. I need it up here. Now, I could get down on my hands and knees and try and get it with my teeth. <laughs> I could try and kick it around and maybe get it up one leg and What if there was a helper? I'm going to say, what if there was an Angie that was with me all the time? Y'all see where I'm going? That was with me all the time. That when I can't do something, this helper, if I allow it, would do it for me. That's grace. We couldn't stop sinning. Man, nobody could stop sinning. But God, by His grace, put first a nature on the inside of you that empowers you to stop sinning. And He gave you the Holy Spirit. 
Spirit who also helps you with any infirmity you might have. And that is by grace. But we have got to learn to grow in grace because I've got a feeling what my life is like from the Holy Spirit's perspective. <laughs> if he looks at my life, and for benefit of those that can't see me, I'm just putting all kinds of stuff on the floor. In other words, I've got all kinds of problems, and I don't know how to fix them. And I'm probably like Saul of Tarsus. I'm working, and I'm working, and I'm working. And God will probably stand right there with an offer and a look and like are you going to help me are you going to let me help you now I, when I was trying to when I was meditating all this I saw a person like in a wheelchair you know little little old hunched over person in a wheelchair and had a cane but they's in a wheelchair too and they couldn't they couldn't open the door and so Angie kind of walked up to open the door here's where a lot of people are took that cane whack whack <laughs> I'll do it myself. And I think we do that more than we realize. Because we haven't grown in grace. I'll figure it out, God. I'll figure out these problems. I'll do better. We revert back to Saul of Tarsus. Instead of Christ. Who strengthens me. Help me. In. Just please help me by, by your grace. I can't get them. See, remember, I have no arms. I'm unable to do it on my own. But God, by His grace, demonstrated by Angie. You do know her name is Angela, which means messenger of God. She's aptly named. <laughs> she named her after her name. You can, you can go sit down now, I think. Just, just give her a hand. When Peter says grow in grace, he's really talking about learn more how to release that power that's on the inside of you. Yes, sir. I believe that's in... Go, go to Ephesians. Um, I think. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Lord. Ephesians chapter 3. Okay. So we all know God can do anything. Isn't that right? Can't God do anything? I, Paul, he just said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, Christ means anointed one. It's, it's that nature of Christ baptized in the Holy Ghost. It's the anointed Christ on the inside of you. And God can do anything. Well, Paul wrote about that over here in Ephesians chapter 3. In this uh, prayer that he wrote. Uh, we'll start in verse 14, Ephesians 3, 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, here it is, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. Here's what it doesn't say. That you would be strengthened with might by your best efforts. No, he strengthens you himself. That's what grace is. Grace helps when you can't help yourself. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. What did Peter say? You need to grow in knowledge. Well, there's a love of God that even is beyond knowledge. See, Sue, Sue loves me. I know that, but I don't know why. I've never understood why. But that doesn't mean I don't reap the benefits. <laughs> I thank God she loves me, you know. I thank God he loves me. But now look at verse 20. Now unto him... That is able to do. Doesn't say he will do. No, he's able to do. Exceeding. Abundantly. Above all that we could ask or think. Wow. Joe, would you like to have some of that? I can think pretty high. <laughs> I can ask pretty high. But he, he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that I could even ask or even think. 
He's able to do it. But what determines if he does it? It's according to the power that worketh in us. Now, what did Paul say? I can do all things through, there's your power right there. Anointed by the Holy Ghost, Christ in you. Christ means the anointed one. It doesn't mean just one. It means the anointed one. That spirit of Christ, that nature of Christ on the inside of you, and the anointing of the Holy Ghost that's on the inside of you, that is the very power of God. And that's how he does it. But you've got to grow in that grace. Yes, sir. Go back to Philippians. I'm going to give you practical instruction. Philippians. Back to Philippians chapter 4. See, right before he starts talking about that, and you've got to remember, Paul is writing this letter from prison. He was in prison when he wrote it. How do I grow in this grace? Well, how you do it is you worry and you fret and you try and figure everything out yourself and you get an extra mortgage on your house and you work two jobs and you tell everybody about your problems and, you know, oh, well, maybe that's not the prescription that he gave here on, on what he was instructed, how to do it. Verse 6, be careful for nothing. Now, in plain modern English, stop worrying. That's what it means. Be careful for nothing but in a few things. Oh, boy, you guys got a good Bible. But in everything, see, I, I'll just tell you right now, Gary needs to grow in this grace right here. It's like, you got a big problem. Oh, man. We better pray. Somebody says, has it come to that? <laughs> Like, only as the last resort, after we've done everything we can possibly do in the natural, now maybe we'll go to God. When Paul said, I, I've learned a few things. I've learned how I can, do, I can do all things through Christ in me. But as I learned, I learned kind of how to do that. Here it is. In everything, by prayer... And supplication. Now, with thanksgiving. Why is that in there? Because you know he heard you. We know that if we ask anything that's according to his will, we know that he hears us and our confidence is if he hears us, then we have the petition that we desire of him. When you pray, expect results. Start thanking him when you pray, not when you see it. It says with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And then that's all there is to it. All I got to do is make the request and thank him for it, and then I can just worry. Oh, oh, well, that's what, I, I, I'm sorry, let's keep reading. And the peace of God, now, if you underline, underline the word peace, because he's going to bracket that with, a, with a, another statement at the end of this. The peace of God. How many loves the peace of God? Oh, man, there's nothing like the peace of God. You could have all kinds of turmoil going on and still be have the peace of God ruling in your heart. I've been right there. You can also not have it. <laughs> I like having it. He's teaching you how to have it. The peace of God which passes understanding. Now, your mind will not be able to understand why you're so peaceful. But it will keep your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. And here's his instruction. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Have you noticed the enemy tries to get you thinking on the exact opposite? Every little thing, whether it could, doesn't have to be little, but every dark, bad, evil thing. You got to be careful thinking about that. No. Think on these things. Now notice what happens if you do. And again, he's putting them in remembrance of himself. The, those things which you have both learned and received and heard, now notice, and seen in me. Paul's not preaching something he didn't do. 
You've seen this in me. Do. Now notice. If you do it, then the God of peace shall be with you. Remember up there he said, Your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God will keep your heart and mind. This is how you do it. But how? What do you mean? Think on things that are true, <laughs> honest, just, pure, lovely, good report. If there be any virtue, if there any praise, think on those things. And if you do that, the God of peace will be with you. And if words mean anything, and if you don't, you won't have any peace. Most of us, uh, practical, man, most of us in prison for not doing anything wrong, Paul didn't steal, he didn't commit adultery, he didn't, he didn't do anything wrong. All he did was preach the gospel. But here he is in prison. And your faithful Philippians have not been sending money. <laughs> of course, they lost, they didn't know where you were. If a person wanted to, couldn't he think on things that are not just, that are not pure, that are not lovely, that are not of a good report? Oh, why, God, did you put me in here? Now even the Philippians, nobody's sending me any money. I'm, I don't have a, there, I can't get, even get a candy bar out of the machine. I'm just saying, most of us would be whining and complaining. Paul said, I had to learn. I had to learn about his grace. I think on things that are pure, he will never leave me nor forsake me. I think that are true, there is a crown of righteousness laid up for me. I think on things that are lovely. I remember that glorious day on the road to Damascus when he delivered me from myself and saved me and brought me into his kingdom. On and on. Paul thought on all those things and it kept him in peace. No matter whether he was abased or abounding, whether he was free, whether he was in prison, he said, I've learned, and if you'll do these same things, the God of peace will be with you. You'll grow in grace. I want to finish with this, I promise. I'm going to show you. Good Lord, somebody scattered all my papers. I don't know who that was. Now, Angie, you're supposed to put them back in sequence. I don't know. She has no, I, I don't even know. Hang on. I'll find it. Here it is. Nope, it's not it. Hmm. Okay. All right. We're just going to do it like this. <laughs> do it like this. coming into a new season when uh, I don't know what this season holds exactly I, don't, I, I really don't know I didn't know what the season held when God told Sue and I to go full time I had, I had thoughts of how things might go and they certainly did not go that way I certainly did not have thoughts that he was going to put us out on a financial limb of a tree and cut the tree off behind us I mean, it was scary as all get out. But as I look back on that now, the only reason that I spent any nights in worry and turmoil, the only reason I spent any time like that, because I did not know him. I just did not know him very well. Well, we all know him a lot better than we did a few years ago. Now let's trust him. Let's grow in grace. And let's understand that no matter what, just say it with me. I can do all things through Christ who is in me. I follow the instructions given by the Apostle Paul. I think on those things that are true, honest, lovely, of a good report, things of virtue and praise. I choose to think on those things. And the God of peace is always with me. I have learned, no matter what state that I'm in, 
to therein be content, for he is with me. Hallelujah. Did you get anything out of that? We are growing in grace. But in that, remember, don't forget that illustration. There's not a person in the sound of my voice that you haven't been struggling with something. Could be a family problem, financial problem, a physical problem, an emotional problem, a job problem. Part of that instruction was stop worrying and pray about everything. Quit trying to figure it out. Go pray. He's standing there like Angie was standing here in the illustration. He is standing there with all of that power waiting for you to pray. You watch what he does. He'll add his power, his wisdom, his strength, and we're going to grow in some grace. Amen? Amen. All right. Hallelujah. Glory to God. All right. So now I'm going to go home and make a list of things that I, I'll tell you an easy way to do it. Just go home and make a list of what you've been worried about. <laughs> Serious. Make a list. And include yourself, your in-laws, your outlaws, your car, your cat, your dog. Well, Alan's dog. <laughs> I don't have a dog. <laughs> there it is right there. Pray about each one of those. And then refuse to worry about it. Thank him that he heard you. And you're going to have all kinds of grace testimonies to give. Because he's not kidding about this. He'll add his strength. He'll add his strength where we're weak. Sunday night's message, I'm trying to quit. I'm really trying to quit. Sunday night's message is titled, He is Attracted by Your Weakness. Did you see that? Angie is attracted when people, anything that they have a lack in their life, any weakness, anything they can't do, if she sees it, she's attracted. She's not repelled. We keep thinking he's repelled by our weakness. No, he's attracted to your weakness. Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong. Why? Because his grace is sufficient. He'll add his strength. Okay, i got to quit. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Thank you. Bring us into this new season. Help us grow in this grace, Lord. You have so many mountains. Lord, in a prophecy you said, you have mountains of grace for us. And few of us ever even hardly touch it at all. And you said in another prophecy to not ever think there's even a possibility that we could exhaust even one of your mountains of grace. But Lord, I feel we, I fear that we, well, I don't want to use the fear. I think, <laughs> Lord, I think, Lord, that we're still very much like the apostle Saul or Saul before he became an apostle. Still floundering around trying to do everything ourselves. Rather and turn to you and receive by grace. Father, help us grow in grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody says, amen. Well, I know everybody here. Yep, yep. Save, 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 save. Feel, feel. Okay. All right. We're not going to have a line tonight. Okay. So you're dismissed. And I don't, is Friday open for prayer? What time? Starting at noon, Friday. Saturday? Saturday also. And that's morning, right? Like 7? 7 in the morning. Okay. Other than that, you're dismissed. Thank you so much. Now, go home and make a prayer list and replace that worry list. <laughs>